Hello. Good morning to everybody. So we are the. So I think nine o'clock. So we should get get start. So thanks for being brave, coming at nine o'clock. So, I mean everybody's awake. So our talk is about LTE and MC catcher myths. So my name is Ravi Shankar Burgaukar. So this is Altaf, Altaf Sheikh. So we two, and this was the joint work with. Uh, Three of our professors, one is Asukan, who is sitting here, uh, and Walter Niami and John Pire Seifert from Berlin. So two professors are from University of Alto, University of Helsinki. I work, I work there, and this he Altaf works for TU Berlin, uh, along with Professor John Pire Seifert. Uh, and I'm a senior researcher, I'm a postdoc researcher, and he's a PhD student, which he's doing right now PhD. So what we're going to cover in this attack, uh, in this talk, some attacks on the 4G phones. So briefly, we'll go over what, what are the fake base stations in GSM 3G, what we know about how they work in 2G, 3G. I'm not going to go in detail, just to give a brief idea how, how things work there, and how, what are the things which are fixed in 4G or LTE networks. I tried to use LTE more often rather than 4G. So how things are fixed in uh, LTE security uh, uh, to, to counteract those fake base station attacks. And then how we build one infrastructure uh, which has a multiple multi-purpose use, so they can test different phones. Maybe you can have a fuzzing platform. And what we discovered during the test, what kind of vulnerabilities we discovered? So there are two classes of vulnerability we discovered. One is the specification issues, and one is the implementation issues in the baseband chipsets. So the, which allows to work MC catcher. So those we'll cover. Also uh, the technique, what the way we will uh, we will 4D, uh, 4G based LTE based stations and. Uh, we're going to show some demos. Unfortunately, we are in the room, so the range is here good, but there are some issues with uh, signals, what we receive, but we try to be, try to get demo works. Or let's see how it works. And then we're going to sh talk about a little bit impact and what, what the issues actually are, uh, what things are fixed so far and what things hasn't fixed in the, in the wild. Uh, before I go in detail, so let me just give the motivation the way we start this work or wh what was the intention building this platform. The first is the baseband story. So this is something uh, which started last two years back where, where many people believe that whether the baseband has a capability to enable some functionality by themselves. So operator can send some message and something can be active on your baseband and they can talk to third parties. This is what exactly MC Catcher does. But, but is it really possible that baseband has a control over the whole access, uh, whole access control? whole access um, processor on the on the processor and there is one thing i don't know you guys note so if you make an emergency call what happens even if your gps is off in some cases your gps turns on automatically even if it's off it's a good feature because you are you are in an emergency and they should know exactly where you are and coordinates help you or in some cases operator can send you some message asking your location so those are different message. Of course, they have authentication. They have a security there. But it also gives you GPS coordinates, even if it's turned off. And that's interesting, right? So how, how the baseband can turn on GPS itself to send the message? And then I thought, OK, that's interesting. So maybe there are some cases or not where we can try to enable GPS. Even the user has turned it off. So I mean, of course, you need to turn on physically, right, with a button. But it might happen. And then we, want to, we started to look around those messages. OK, what are those messages, how they are authenticated? Uh, so in 2G, 3G, frankly, it's possible. So we have a protocol in 2G and 3G called RRLP. In 3G, they have different versions. So actually, you can easily ask any phone which is connected over 2G that, hey, give me your location coordinate, and it, go it gives you GPS. That's way rather easy. But those things are fixed in 3G, which will not work at all uh, for, LTE, for LTE. And then we started to dig more into the documents, OK, what are those messages, how we can enable, because we don't have a platform that. So it, it just went on finding those digging information. And then we came along this, this uh, so far, finding those vulnerabilities, which were, which were different. Uh, then second point about the way you start research to building some platform where we can test LTE phones. So there are many fuzzing platforms to fuzz 2G phones, 3G phones. But OK, 3G phones, there are still software is not available as it is. But you can modify some, some, some available software to test the 
uh, 3G phones. But GSM, everybody knows we have open VTA, so we have open BSC, Osmo uh, software, so we can try, you can fuzz the phone. Many people have tried that. They can crash the phone with SMS, they can reset the phone. Many things you could try with the fuzzing, and, uh, and there, is, there are many vulnerabilities. But for LTE, there was nothing. And so this is our effort to build something where we can test different 4G phones, their implementations. We can figure out how we can compromise those phones or, or, or what are the vulnerabilities. And the last point is, again, we are coming in the age somewhere we, we know that the attacking cost, like building this kind of platform, which costs somewhere around 1,250 euro. So in dollar, it goes around 1,400 and 500, something around. So this, this is the cost of a hardware to, to make those attacks. So which has been going low, lower and lower day by day. And at the same time, what are the security measures has been designed onto those protocols long time back, like 15 years. And there are some missing features. I wouldn't say missing features, but some unique features which are coming into every generation as it is. So nobody put efforts to delete unwanted features that on every phone, which are, which are never used from last 15 years. And somebody could exploit those measures as it is. So this is the, the equation which, has, which hasn't been solved. So this might be helpful for the 5G guys that they have to take those attacks seriously, especially the active attacks. So these this were three motivations with this study, well, at least we had initially to, to prove that, uh, that this is a, the case. So this talk is about mostly 4G. So we're not going to talk about 2G, 3G phones at all. So 4G architectures and how, how do we build the LTE attacks. So let me tell you before that, uh, if, you, if you look at your phone and you go on a mobile network setting, very few phones has this feature called LTE only. I guess some Chinese phone shows this LTE feature, not your Samsung phone or some other phones. So this feature is good because if you, if you attach your phone to LTE only, and if you have somewhere near around 2G and 3G MC catchers, they will not work at all because they, they can't downgrade you. They can downgrade you, so you will go, you will go out of service, but they will, you will not attach to their uh, 2G or 3G MC catcher. So this is the case where you attach the phone with LTE only, and that, that's what we show when your phone is attached to LTE only. So what kind of attack you could do to, 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 get, your private, to, to get your private information? So if you look at the brochure of different MC catcher, you can Google and you can figure out. Everybody claims that, okay, they have a 4G MC catcher. Uh, it, it can gather the IMEI, it can gather the MC and all those things. But this is not the case because they usually downgrade you and they collect the information. What they can only get when you put your phone on LT only that they can only get the MC. Because even the IMEI will not be given because this has given the protection in uh, LTE systems. So, so these are the cases. And this talk, we will talk about, uh, we'll talk about only LT when your phone is on LT only. So let's go before uh, giving some introduction with the fake base stations, what exactly or what, what, they, what their goal is. So two purpose for the MC catchers. First is, as I said, to collect the information, which is the IMSI, <coughs> which is the unique number which is on your SIM card, which recognizes you that this, is, this is belongs to you. IMEI, which is the unique number of your mobile phone, which you can also see, which can't change at all. Okay, there are ways to change, but this is illegal to change those numbers. And third is location tracking. And there are different methods of location tracking. They can also ask your GPS coordinates or the surrounding base station uh, coordinates, and you can use the Google Maps to see where you are. Or, or there are some uh, special direction finder antennas the MC catcher guys use to exactly pinpoint where you are. So they have a van. They, they see exactly where the guy is, but how to find the direction. So they have big and bigger antenna attached to the car, which exactly finds, OK, this guy is in this direction. So those are the methods they use. Uh, and also the second part is call and data interception, which is not the focus of this talk. So we're gonna, not going to talk about the second where the MC cache are attached to you and they try to snoop on your calls or they intercepts or they wiretap all outgoing or incoming call and SMS. So what we're going to focus here only on the first part, this is about collecting the data. Uh, so in GSM, what we know, everybody uh, has known or they have proved that the problem with the GSM networks or 3G networks. So 3G networks are partially secure because they have a mutual authentication. It's not that easy that, okay, if you have a femtocell, which is the small, which is the small base station, if it's a 3G, then actually you can bypass anything. So it has, this has been proved by our group already with a femtocell, uh, femtocell based MC catchers. Uh, again, so this called, uh, called as the MC catchers. I was using a fake base station just to avoid. So, on the detection side, how do you detect that if there is MC catcher, right? So this is the different part. So there are some tools to detect MC catchers. So one famous is a crypto phone. So that has a firewall on the baseband firewall, which can detect suspicious activity which are going on. Uh, last year, Black Hat in the US, we also released the tool called Darshak. So this, is, this works for only Infineon uh, baseband, unfortunately. 
uh, that time it was only available this one. Then the Snoop Siege guys, they modified to our tool to work on a, a Qualcomm chipset. So it works on a larger, uh, larger, larger for mobile phone base. So this, these tools try to detect, okay, if there is a fake base station, these try to attach or collect information and can, can gives you alert a little bit. But for normal users, why I said it's a difficult, uh, for normal users, all these tools works if your device is rooted. If device is not rooted, those tools will not work. So this is not a normal application which you can install from Android store. So there is one other application called Android MC Catcher or something. I guess you guys might have heard actually. The problem with, this tool, with those tools is that they can't collect the baseband data or baseband log, which is important. This is the raw data which is important to detect MC Catcher. So you can't build in such an app. You, can rely, you can't rely on a Google APIs to give this information because those information can be spoofed easily. But what information comes from a baseband, that's a genuine information which is coming from the base station. And this, is, uh, this, this information is difficult to get from an Android app or even you, can, you can't write any app which gives this data. So it's about the API limitations of Android uh, which, or Android or iOS. You can't get the data. So we are coming in at one stage a little bit where MC catchers are getting modern and modern. So they have uh, different techniques, how, how they work. So this was the one uh, uh, case was released or uh, some media articles uh, by, about the techniques, the advanced people, advanced uh, location tracking techniques. So you see there is a plane actually, and uh, so plane is, uh, has a fixed wings and some directional antenna which, which can focus on a crowd from a top. Uh, on the first case, so second case, they, can, they have a targets to collect which the user has to target. They know the guy phone number, for example, and they know they have to find this guy in the crowd. So there are some techniques they can ping that ping the guy, and they can try to find out where he where he is. The third step, okay, they know where the guy is now. They have to find exactly the location. So they say the plane moves into another position to detect the signal strength and location. So it's a it's a vague word. So signal strength means there are some cases where the, they can ask the phone to send some reports. It's called measurement reports, and and they, they can be used to collect the surrounding base station tower. For example, this guy on the third picture you see, he's standing here, so surrounding there are maybe three or four base stations. What this plane tried to do is, it tried to collect the surrounding base stations and try to pinpoint where the guy is standing. Or the location, if his phone supports GPS coordinate, or if he's on 2G or 3G, so they can also get the GPS coordinate of this guy exactly, he's standing in the crowd and this is his position for something. And okay, and the controller who is sitting in the room, he can get the information from the plane right away. Hey, this guy is here, and they can send the police van. Okay, this guy is exactly on this position. Just go and uh, try to catch him. So, like, they are getting pretty advanced with those techniques, right? So, but why this works in 2G and 3G, and why we're trying to say these are the myths, at least for the 4G, and what things has been uh, fixed? So, GSM, everybody knows that okay, it's lacks, it lacks mutual authentication between face station and mobiles. So, this is known flaw from long time. Uh, that's what that's what most of the industry catcher works. They can intercept your calls as long as they have a backend support to systems uh, supports your uh, 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 voice over calls. So maybe you can use a VoIP or you can use a SIP method to support backend call, and you can intercept all the calls in GSM, right? In 3G, it has been fixed, so it's barely you find a 3G MC catcher which which works by itself. It means that without downloading on a 2G network. So there are a femtos the, there are femtosales which can act like that, but you need a backend support to support those calls. So, uh, so maybe some uh, support over satellite for the backbone network, uh, and then you need to have active support from some operator, basically. So if you, if you see that somebody is selling those kind of solutions, so definitely they have agreement with an operator to support those calls. So, in, uh, so there is integrity protection like in LTE, also in 3G, that it, it will not, every message will not work as in GSM. And basically, everybody works with the downgrade tags. The problem with GSM 3G and also in LTE, or you guys might have noticed, so if you just see the protocol, how things work, the total control is always to the base station. The base station decides the way he wants to talk. If your phone says, okay, you don't support this algorithm, you don't support this authentication, I'm not gonna talk to you, this doesn't happen. The power is always given to the base station. He decides what algorithm has to use, what algorithm has not to use, how you, how you should communicate or not. So this is the way the system has been designed. The more power is to the base station, so the way you define it, the phone will act according to that. So there is no, no capability for the mobile phone. And uh, other problem is MC and IMEI, which is your uh, main identifier, this belongs to you. So MC is fine. MC, you can't relate that whether you are there or not, but this is a single identity which stays forever in your SIM card. So you move anywhere, and if you leak this data, which tells that this is the, you, this is the right guy, you, plus IMEI. This also gives some hint, because 
every IMEI, even if I record your IMEI, I can just go on a database which is available on the online tag database, and I can just put the MC there, uh, IMEI there, and I can see whether you are using a Galaxy S5, Galaxy S4. And once I know that this guy is using, for example, uh, iPhone, so I know his IMEI pattern, I can easily say that, okay, this was the right guy because he has iPhone. So I can correlate both those things to see this is the right guy. So these things works in, 3G, uh, in, uh, in GSM and 3G as it is. So this was about the background, uh, background with uh, 2G and 3G. Now let's come back to LTE. What has been fixed in LTE? What's the architecture for the LTE and uh, how, how the things has been got improved? <laughs> so slowly, slowly we have a large uh, LTE user base. Now even we are surprised now, we are testing the last two days here for the tags. And actually there is quite wide coverage of the LTE networks and, uh, itself in Amsterdam. So most of the Europe's big cities has been covered with LTE now. So you, uh, you get, uh, even in the buildings you get coverage with the LTE. Support for voice over LTE is not available yet, so it's quite kind of limited. So most of the times you, you get a call when you're on LTE network, basically you fall back to 3G and you get a call. So not every operator supports voice over LTE call yet, so which, which, you, which you see in, uh, in future. Of course, it has a high-speed high data connection, that's what everybody tried to be. And it's unlimited data, basically, right? You just have a monthly subscription and you get unlimited data, and, uh, and we, we'll come back to it, how, 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 how this can be a bad feature, for example, uh, with a high connection, uh, with high-speed data. Then we have, a, and it's a more secure than previous generation, because it has been designed in such a way that they try to solve the problems, what they had in 2G and 3G, how they can fix it. They fix the protocols, all those things, uh, and the best effort to avoid previous mistakes. So what I, why I said best effort, because they can't change everything because the way system has been designed. So you can't really design something unique and secure, but you have to have a fallback, you have to support the fallback legacy system to work everything. So you can't say, okay, Netherlands solve this architecture, so all the operators in Netherlands have a new mechanism, but what if the Dutch guy goes to some other country, his phone will not work because they don't support that network. So it's a fallback support system to, to give support to the older generation. So they have a best effort how they can improve the mistakes. So uh, let's talk about architecture, which, which we try to show in the demo. So that's what I just give a significance of that architecture, what we have in the demo. So UE, which is called user equipment. So these are the LTE terms, 4G terms. So UE belongs to user, user equipment. Uh, the base station, which is called E node B, that's also a technical term with a 3G standardization. In GSM, which is called as a BTS, uh, or 3G in called BTS or base station. Uh, on the right side we have, a, so this is the part which is on a radio link, which is always you see like in the building, you see the uh, tower, then you have a mobile phone, this is the only part we have a visible. From here the connection goes back into the core network, so this is the part of core network operator, which is closely garden, so you don't see or you don't have a direct access to this part at all. And there, there comes the MME, which is the uh, mobility management entity, which attached to the phone or which, which gives all the needed parameters to support your calls, data, and SMS. Uh, this is equivalent to RNC, if I say, but uh, this has been fixed into uh, the part of E node B also. I mean, so in 3G and 4G, there is a difference between the way has been put the radio network controller. And uh, from MME connection goes to internet, just to show you, but there are many other components in the core network, which I will, I will, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about. So what we're gonna cover here, so we will have our own base station, which is here. Uh, then we have a, a user equipment, uh, which is your mobile phone, and there are two kind of protocols which goes, one is called AS, which is the access stratum protocols. So there are different kind of security levels. So what the attacks we're gonna show is about the access network security protocols, and those are, comes on this interface called AS. And we're not gonna talk about the communication between your phone and which lands in the MME. So this is the different task which is required where, where your calls are getting, into, uh, getting encrypted. So, and this, this talk is mostly on, on, on this uh, layer. So now, paging in LTE and how paging has been done. So Altaf will continue with, uh, he, will, he will tell, paging means, now we saw the phone and base station, what happens if somebody calls you? or when you make a call, how things happen on the, uh, on the radio link layer, how the paging uh, has been happened. Okay. Uh, I'll brief about a little bit about uh, the paging procedure in LTE. So let's say you have an incoming call and uh, somebody's trying to call you and uh, so the MME receives a message telling that okay, some, 
somebody is trying to call, and uh, it creates a paging message. The next slide, I'll explain you like what this paging message really consists of. The, the paging message is actually sent to the base stations, and the base stations finally deliver it to the, the, the phone. And the phone recognizes whether uh, it contains, whether it, it's, it belongs to its own. And then, according to that, it responds like there's a um, RRC procedure, like um, the radio connection setup procedure that happens, and then there's security setup, and after that, your message is exchanged with the phone and the base station. So the paging message actually consists of uh, team Cs. So those are called temporary identifiers, or they can also contain MC, sometimes, rarely. Um, let's, let, he, uh, here we'll talk about like, what, ha what happens when, when the paging message actually consists of team Cs. So the, there's an incoming call, and the E node B creates the paging message and delivers it to the phones. Yeah. We want to show what's the difference between uh, the paging that happened in GSM 3G and the paging that's happening in uh, LTE. So that's a little bit different. And uh, before that, I give a little bit explanation about uh, what is the uh, network architecture planning. Let's say a complete city is divided into multiple tracking areas, and tracking areas are further divided into cells. Those are kind of microcells, so smaller than uh, regular GSM macrocells. Mm. So in, in GSM, let's say when there was an incoming call, the paging, the, the base, I mean, the, the network actually sends paging message to all the base stations in this tracking area. So all the base stations pays the, send the paging message, and all, all the cells actually receive, and many phones receive the paging message. So this is kind of actually wasting the resources. So what the change in LTE was, uh, it's called a smart paging. So the network actually page uh, the, the, the paging message is sent from the base station where the phone was last seen or last attached to. So the paging message is sent. If there is no response within three seconds, so then the paging messages are sent to entire tracking area. So this is just to save some resources on the network side. We'll show you like how this kind of uh, smart paging methods actually help in tracking somebody. So let's say like when we send the paging message to a complete area, Let's say somebody is sitting in a cell one and sniffing. So he'll be able to receive the paging message. But what, hen, what can he infer from that? He can only infer that uh, the guy is present in this complete tracking area. Let's say the paging is sent only to, to the one cell. So somebody is sniffing in that cell. And they can actually infer that, OK, since the paging message is being sent to only this cell, so the guy is in this cell. And from then, they can actually go further tracking. Yeah. We want to show like what, what's changed in LTE with respect to, I mean, in, in terms of security with respect to fake base stations. So there is a mutual authentication between uh, base stations and phones. So both has to successfully pass the authentication procedure step. And then there is mandatory integrative, integrity protection for all messages. There are certain messages that don't need integrity protection, and we'll show you what are those. And uh, there is one big change was uh, IMEI is not going to be sent out by the UV unless the, fo unless the network asks in an integrity protected message. So it's like some, the request has to come from an authenticated base station. Only then the phone responds to the IMEI. And yeah, there is a little bit uh, difference in building an MC cacher on GSM and uh, LTE. Um, the difference was like, I mean, if you take the base stations in GSM, the simple technique was like you put up a RF uh, devices and you transmit with high power, and then the phones will actually connect to the base the fake base station. But this doesn't work straight ahead in LTE. There's a little bit change. Um, the change was like, let's say the phone is having very good signal strength. If you see all the four bars are high, um, it means that the phone is, the phone doesn't even monitor its surrounding cells, so it's not really checking other frequencies or something. So even if an attacker comes with a fake base station, this phone doesn't even camp on his fake base station. <coughs> but how to overcome this? We found a technique um, that's called, uh, we exploit some high priority frequencies that are mentioned in the system information messages. Um, so the purpose of this high priority frequencies is that the phone has to periodically monitor these high priority frequencies 
periodically. So let's say the, somehow the attacker came to know that these are the high priority frequencies and he set up his base station and then he can actually trap the phone to camp on his base station. So that's how we do it. Um, yeah. So while working, studying about LTE, like we found several implementation flaws, specification flaws, and so we will show you all the, all of those. And so the specification vulnerabilities will be explained by Ravi. So now this is about the background and the way the way things has been built. But now we go about uh, okay, what kind of classes of vulnerability we found, and what does it mean, and what it impacts to everybody. So there are two classes, as I said. First class is about specification vulnerabilities. Uh, so specifications means uh, there is an organization called TGPP. That's the from the ITSI European uh, it's European agency who designs the protocol stack like GSM uh, GSM 3G and 4G. So design the protocols how they should be work and how they should behave and all the baseband vendors they implement everything into their baseband chipset. So it's called baseband. So they wrote the source code for that. At the same side, on the network side, they also implement the same kind of mechanism. So every phone can talk to each other as per the standard. So, and uh, they design in such a way that they try to counteract all threads, uh, all threads, how, how authentication and encryption should happen. So this is about those standards, and uh, while studying those standards, we figure out that what are the issues that, what can, that can be exploited for 4G networks. So if your phone is on only 4G, so what could go wrong on this category? The first thing about is broadcast information. So what we're going to talk about here is RRC protocol, which is uh, used to set up and manage your over-the-air radio connectivity. It means the moment you turn on the phone and the moment uh, or the time it takes to attach, the, what kind of messages you exchange, so this is this protocol, this is, which is called RRC protocol. Uh, the first class is not really vulnerability, but it's like uh, the way a system has been designed, and that's what actually it leaks your information, uh, which is called broadcast information. And it's not really a flaw or vulnerability, but this is the way system design, and uh, this should work in this fashion, because the best effort was to allow you any mobile to connect in terms of a failure, failure, case, a failure case. And broadcast information, he, as he explained the paging, it means that if you get a call, your identifier is always in this tracking area, the complete tracking area or in the cell. So like base station sends message, hey, where this guy is, this guy is getting a call. And this information is like broadcasted. So if you have a tool, you can, you're going to sniff this information at any time. And this information contains like a network information, which is called system, blo system information block messages, which contains, which, is, which are used to build an MC catcher. So if you know any MC catcher, what it does first is just scan the surrounding information. And the surrounding information means this is the broadcast information. So this gives the attacker to set up the, the, uh, the critical information to set up the base station so that he can force the guy or force the target to attach to his MC catcher. And plus, these messages are not authenticated or encrypted. And this is the way they can get your information and they try to camp on it. So I'm, I'm not going to say this is the vulnerability issue or anything, but this is the way MC catchers try to exploit most of the uh, things on the first point. Uh, the second is uh, this is the new uh, discovery which we did. Uh, that while reading all the standard messages, we figured out that there was one document called 3 gpts 363331 Okay, if you are into standards, so you know. So, so these kind of standards are not easy to understandable by, uh, by, by the guy if you are working on IP protocol or different protocol stacks. So this is not easy to understand if you are not into the telco domain. So this is just a reference to those documents. And there is one uh, case in this uh, report which is about uh, uh, UE measurement reports. So what does it contain? So this, these are the reports used for the handovers. Handover means like you are in the train and you're traveling to Amsterdam Airport. So you're going to change base stations maybe three, four times depending on the network architecture. And while you're camping from one station to other station and you're, you're in the call, the handover happens. But you don't notice anything, right? So during the handover, mobile, mobile phone creates those measurement reports, sends back to the, uh, uh, to the network saying that, okay, these are the measurement reports, my signal strengths and everything, and that is used to decide the next base station automatically. So this happens very instant. You don't feel any delay, and these are the reports needed to get those, those kind of information. Uh, we figure out that those are the measurement messages are not, uh, so those are the requests asked by the base station is not authenticated, and the reports which are sent by the phone are not encrypted. So what does it mean? Sounds really simple, right? But these reports contains the information which can, be identif which can be used to identify your location. So this is just to give brief. So that for example, you have a base station, which is the fake base station. It just sends you a single message saying that RRC connection reconfiguration and give me your measurement report. So mobile phone doesn't verify this is the right guy or bad guy. 
it just collects the information and sends back to sends back to the to the attacker, which contains the measurement report. And this measurement report contains uh, two types of information which can be used to identify your location. Uh, the first part is about the surrounding microcell and their signal strength. For example, right now my phone is here, and what kind of signal strength I receive from three different base stations or four base stations surrounding the area. This can be used to identify my, my location. This is called trial creation method, which is, which is uh, used by even for the emergency services. For example, if you call the emergency services fire like 112, they can get your location coordinates also based on the surrounding towers, which your phones gives when you make an emergency call. So this is the same technique used by the emergency agencies to identify you. And now any, any guy who has a fake base station can also ask this information and try to identify you in the same area. Now the only problem here is that these attacks are local. So what we estimated so far, so if you have proper antenna, so this attack or this message can be sent from two kilometer distance. So you can identify the target precise location, which has a barely accuracy of 10, 10 to 50, uh, 20 to 50 meters uh, with the uh, coordinates. At the same time, this measurement report can also give you location coordinate, like a GPS. It gives the GPS coordinates, so I don't need to have any triangulation method. It gives me the precise information where the target is within the two kilometer area. So this was the first. Uh, the second is the second class of uh, specification vulnerability we had about this uh, EMM protocol, which is used to which is used for controlling uh, uh, your mobiles, UE mobility in the LTE network, how you move around the networks. Uh, or uh, uh, so this is there is one procedure called tracking area update procedure. For example, when you are moving from this area to Amsterdam Airport, you you went to this area. Your phone, as 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 soon as you come to the airport area or the base station, which is in the that area, it try to update your location, like saying tracking area update, and and let's to try uh, let's try to do the tracking area update request. It sends back to the mobile uh, to the tower saying, okay, this is my tracking area request. I came from this area. This these were my coordinates, and. And uh, during this procedure, MME, which is the part in the core network, and UE agrees which kind of network mode it can select, right? And uh, the TU reject message are like a message which tells that whether you are the right guy, you're allowed to camp on this area. So this is the case, for example, in a roaming scenario. If you land in, uh, in Berlin, for example, uh, if you have a subscription you bought from a KPN or T-Mobile here, and you're not allowed to have a roaming, and when you land there, you're going to send this tracking area update, update request message to the uh, base station in Berlin and says, hey, I want you to authenticate now. And if, you're, if you don't have a roaming agreement, you're going to get a tracking area reject message saying that this, this user is illegal or he doesn't have a capability to roam. So this kind of reject message we, uh, we found out. But the problem with those reject messages is that, so those are messages not integrity protected. It means that those are not really being like, it, it never checks that this reject message comes from a real base station or a fake base station. So if we have a fake base station, and if somebody is trying to camp on our mobile phone, we can send this message saying that you are illegal customer, you are illegal customer, you're not allowed to roam. And the problem we figured out that if you make this kind of DOS attack on, the, on every 4G phones, your phone goes in a denial of service for almost like a 72 hours. If you don't do anything on your phone, your phone will be out of service, you will not notice. Until unless, until unless you notice that you are not able to make a call or you are not receiving a call. So if you're an idle, your phone goes off like 70, 72 hours. This is the problem with the M2M devices where, where nobody checks. So your M2M device will be, or Internet of Things device will be off for 72 hours. So by standard says that, or the problem we figure out in the standard, standard says that the time, the time to device will be inactive like 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours. That's, that's, that's a too large, too large uh, counter for this. And the only method to recover from this DOS attack, like if you call customer care, hey, my phone is not working, how should I recover? So they will say restart the phone. Yeah, that is the only one solution they have, restart the phone, or take out the SIM card and put, re reinsert again. So that's the only mechanism by the standard has been proposed. So mobile phone will not be recovered by itself until you restart the device or you, you reset the same. So these were the two, uh, two specification vulnerabilities, but there are different attacks what we tried with those. Like with those tracking area reject messages, you can also have the downgrade attack. So you can force the mobile phone, go to 2G and 3G, and you will never notice at all. Until unless you see that why, why from last month I'm not going on a 4G network. Because if you don't restart your phone, this phone is going to be on only 2G and 3G networks forever. Until you restart. Uh, you're not going to notice at all with this silent denial of service attack. Now, uh, we'll come about the building of uh, fake base station, the way we build fake base stations. But before that, let me make it clear that w so all the research, what we did with base stations, we had a Faraday cage in Berlin. <laughs> Uh, where the joint research has been done. So we have a Faraday cage where we have a, our in, a test environment where we run the MC catcher. So we pro took properly care of this one. Uh, now we're going to also show the demo. So during the demo, if somebody has a problem, 
we try to configure such a way base station that your normal service will not disturb at all. If you have a concern, you can turn off your phone uh, or, or put into flight mode if you really want. But uh, your pro normal service will not get attached. Emergency services are also going to work. So if you have a really concern about emergency services, you can leave the room if you want. Uh, but everything will be work, even if you can make emergency calls. So now Altaf will give you just introduction about the way uh, he tried to build the software initially and the way we modified for the different phones and what kind of Okay, you can trust us like we are not, we play it safe. Okay, yeah, this is the attack setup. You have a laptop and uh, this is USRP. So it's typically a radio. So we use it for, we connect it via USB to the laptop. We have the base station software running on the laptop. We have several phones to test with. We also tried some of the latest phones and up to date. Okay, we should really thank the, the guys of OpenLTE and SRSLTE guys. They have done a good job. So we got the eNodeB application from OpenLTE, but this is not really a sophisticated or complete uh, eNodeB or base station application. We had to really program it a little bit to actually do the attacks. Also, SRSLTE, where we find some application about uh, passive scanning and this thing, but we really had to modify things and it doesn't work straightforward. Mm. So after having this setup, like we, we came to figure out that, okay, these are the specification vulnerabilities and uh, what could we, we have this setup and let's try. When we are trying this kind of things, like we actually found out some implementation vulnerabilities in the baseband. And in, for example, like from, from the beginning, we were telling that IMEA should not be allowed to sent by the UV unless it's asked in an integrity protected uh, message. But what we found was some of the uh, basebands were actually giving the IMEA. And there's a trick for that. It doesn't give straightforward, but there's a trick. What we do is like we send a special reject message, TAU reject message with a certain cause. The cause is uh, UV identity cannot be derived. So let's say the phone is actually attaching to the base station and the base station tells that, hey, I don't know your identity. And what the phone does is it deletes all its uh, previous security context and all its previous temporary identifiers. And then, and then now the base station is capable of asking the IMEI and the phone just directly gives it. So we found out this, and the next one was uh, RLF reports, radio link failure reports. These are uh, really necessary uh, to have it in the specification, but uh, the specification actually mandates security for uh, these RLF reports, radio link failure reports, but uh, we found that some of the basebands really don't implement any security, and these RLF reports actually carry some critical information for example, measure, uh, signal strengths, which can be used for uh, locating somebody. Um, actually, the, the purpose of RLF reports is like to actually uh, have a good coverage, uh, coverage map of the operator, like how good are the signals inside some buildings or anywhere. These help in actually making a good coverage map for the operators. And uh, yeah. Yeah, the next. Uh, yeah, just tell me, like, what, what, what else do you need if you have somebody's GPS coordinates to locate them? Yeah. So we were playing with some latest phones, and they were actually giving us the yeah, latitude and longitude. So we actually don't need any measurements. So we just directly have the uh, latitude and longitude to locate somebody. So somebody is sitting from two kilometer distance and is able to uh, without the user's know-how, he's able to get the location coordinate from him, and yeah, these reports are not authenticated nor encrypted. These reports can also go into the measurement reports. Uh, Ravi was talking in the uh, specification vulnerabilities. And yeah, next was, uh, okay, this is on the phone side. On the Now we are actually looking, also looking on the, the net operator side. We found some network configuration issues that actually help in tracking. So this is the trace uh, that we noted. Like we turn on the phone, we look the temporary identifier assigned to it, and then we turn off the phone. After a few hours, we again turn on the phone, and then we observe the what is the temporary identifier assigned. So that was the first one, second one, third one. So we did the test continuously for three days, and we we actually noted the how the temporary identifiers were assigned to the phone. So it's like this pattern, and do you find any randomness in this pattern? So that was. Uh, we found in some operator in Berlin, and this was in Finland. 
we also found similar issues in here. And yeah, this should actually change. Mm, this allows you know, tracking somebody very easily. So it, there's no randomness in that. And we don't know like how many operators use the same kind of equipment to you know, randomize the TIMCs this way, but OK. Now, uh, what are the different ways to track somebody? Previously, you have seen uh, silent SMS, silent calls in GSM, but now LTE is uh, moving to data applications, Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, LinkedIn, everything. So we found some issues with these applications also. So what we did was like uh, we took the Facebook application. I think most of us have it. We have the Messenger application, Android application, or iOS installed in our phone. So let's say I'm not friend with somebody, and I send them a message. What happens is uh, the message gets delivered. So there's a paging message. So somebody sniffing can actually observe the paging message. But the message is not notified on the phone. So an attacker can continuously send 10 to 15 messages and actually observe uh, a parallelly sniff on the air interface and observe the team sees that are coming in the paging message. So let's say for t if, he, if he observes 10 or 15 team sees, the same, t the, the same team sees, it, he can actually confirm that, OK, this guy is in this location. And then later, he can actually put up his uh, fake base station and then get the precise location using measurement reports or GPS coordinates. We found similar issues in uh, uh, Twitter also, um, where, where when you're not following somebody, you send a message. OK, it's delivered, but uh, there's also a paging message to observe. And um, yeah, we actually gone, go, went public uh, with, with all these attacks on 28th of October, telling that, OK, Facebook, this and this problem. And uh, immediately after two days, there was a fix. The Facebook actually closed this others folder now, I mean, this issue. And actually, there, there was no acknowledgment to us or something. But, but this was a nice coincidence, unnoticed. Hidden coincidence. Okay. Okay. Now we go with some attack demos. We actually sniff some of the air interface um, passively, and yeah, let's see. Oh, I have to load it. So this first class of attack uh, can be also done with uh, uh, if you have this uh, STR dongles actually. So this is now the first attack is only about the sniffing. So what we are doing with the base station, but it can be also done in the low cost. It can be cost only $20, $20 to you. So you can just buy this SDR stick, and you can just, again, the software will not work off the tail. You need to modify some, some, some extent to work right. So this is like we modified such a way that we, just to show that it works. And this is about the passive monitoring, just to identify whether you're in this area or not with the Facebook. Like you can send the Facebook message, and you can just monitor all, those, all the identities and uh, broadcast the message. Yeah, it takes a little bit of time, but uh, it was really problematic uh, doing these tests in this room because buildings and iron are not really good friends with uh, electromagnetic waves. Uh, it takes a little bit of time, but yeah. So with the Facebook, the way, the way he explained the fa with Facebook thing and why we use Facebook, uh, as, I, as I told you, with LTE, there is a problem uh, with the configuration of uh, MME nodes. and. Uh, they have problems with the unique randomness of TMC, or a, which is called a GUTI in LTE. So right now I use, just use as a temporary identifier called TMC, for example. So those were not really random, or those were not really assigned in a, in a time like a new one or a fresh one. Even they assigned a fresh one, those are not unique. So I can easily pinpoint even in five days that whether you are in this area or not without knowing MC. And this is like a TMC has been designed in such a way that it should conceal your real identity. And this is not the practice with LTE. There's a main problem with LTE, why everybody, why operator doesn't do like this. Like in 2G, 3G, with every your call is authenticated, with even the data connection. But in 4G, operators assume that it's really secure. We don't need to do authentication, we don't need to reinitiate the keys, or we don't need to do, again, multiple times. So they barely do authentication even after five days, actually, and this is really wrong. So you rely on 4G security that is completely secure, and you don't do anything. You even don't change identifier. This is like... Come on, I mean, you have to at least change the identifier, and this is the practice. So this, this is allows you to track, track uh, using those, those uh, uh, passive sniffers. So this is mostly, mostly consists about the passive and semi-passive attack, where some, some use, some use, semi-passive means uh, somebody trying to send you Facebook message or silent SMS, 
or maybe a silent call. So silent call, just to give you introduction, what the silent calls means, which was on the slide. Like, when I call this guy, right the moment I call, now the message goes to the tower. From the tower, he gets that he's getting a call. He gets the mobile message in his mobile phone. So before it starts ringing, I, I measure the time, how, how much time it takes to ring. And before he, his phone rings, actually, I need to turn it down. So I make a silent call. So I see his identity is on this area. So this is called a silent call method. So this is not a really precise method because you have to do a lot of measurements and reading, uh, reading how much time it takes to deliver the call. And then you have to disconnect like at that time. Uh, silent, and of course, you need, to have phone, you need to know the phone number to make the silent call. And that's what we're trying to use with LTE. So operators don't fix their uh, team C or don't, don't have the randomness. So we can easily use an application like a Facebook, Twitter, or even the LinkedIn or any IM client. So yeah, hopefully now. Yeah, these are the list of teams. I think he opened the door. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. But yeah, this is how the flow goes. But it's a little bit not really high flow. But normally it used to be high flow if I do it outside. So if you do on the street, actually, we're gonna see like a complete screen, like a full of identity. So what we are seeing here is that some guys got some guys around this area are getting paid. So we're not doing anything illegal here. This is just a broadcast message which everybody can listen here. So these are the identities, somebody is getting a call, somebody is getting a data, and those identities are getting paged that, and that's we are listening here, and that we are telling. And now we can correlate. If we send like a 10 message with some particular guy, if you know somebody's Facebook account or Twitter, we can send on his, on his Facebook or Twitter, hey, uh, like, hey, what's going on, or something like that. And we can correlate the timing, and we can capture those identities in some time frame and correlate whether this was in this area or not. So this is like a passive attack where we can correlate whether the guy was there. So we're not going to show the passive attack because we don't have a time. So now let's shift back to the active attacks, which is the real attack. For example, well, we're going to have a uh, okay. another, our test network, so your phone will not get disturbed at all. So what we're going to do with active attacks, we're going to run the real base station, the 4G base station. There will be a test phone, and when we just turn on this phone, it automatically connects back to the base station. And how the way we collect IMEI, MC, what we so it's a combination of specification vulnerabilities and IMEI, which will show in a single demo the way we get all the surrounding towers nearby, the way we get IMEI, and we'll explain how, how the things happen in the background. So again, it takes a little time just to run the second applications, second application for the active attack. Connecting his uh, own phone. Yeah, I have my phone and. So if you scan now, if you have a phone, if you scan uh, network connections, you might see a different network here now. Like if you see KPN Telecom or something like, you might see a different test network, something, some name on your phone, just to see this is a, a real base station working on. So. So he turned on the phone. So as he, as he explained that this is a new technique you have to build the MC catcher. This will not work as a GSM or 3G. You have to have a higher frequency to, to because the problem is if your my phone is attached to the 4G and it has a really good signal, even though it has a bad signal, it's not going to connect automatically here until and unless it has been put on the higher frequency. So in the background, what he did, so he did, it, 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 so he the, his phone automatically connected to the base station because it's running on the test network. So of course, as as I told you, MC is going to be recovered. MC is going to be covered straight ahead uh, uh, with any network. Plus, we, we exploit the vulnerability in the phone. This is the phone we use. And uh, this is the one, this, not every vendor leaked this IMEI, as, as we told. So there was one major vendor was having this vulnerability issue in, uh, every day uh, in all phones. So this is the IMEI. In the second time, what we have these three base stations surrounding which we recorded, E node B1. So this has the, uh, like, uh, the number. 101, this power, what exactly the power of this base station uh, from the mobile phone. The second E node B, third E node B, and the fourth E node B. So it can be more E node B uh, depending on the operator settings. So we try to show you the three, 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 uh, three, uh, three E node B because these are the methods used for the trial creation method. So there are some formula, the way you, uh, way you take this information and try to identify the, the user. So now if you see, 
So these are the three tower cell IDs, which we just map on the, we, get, we just use the Google API to just show these base stations. So these are the four base stations surrounding, no, the fourth one, okay, you just had a three ones, okay. So these are the three base stations which comes on the map and the target is here. So now we, we haven't applied the, the formula which we explain in the paper, by the way. So if you really want to know the formula or the, the method, so they use the different triangulation method by every base station has, for example, some circle area it covers by every base station and if you, draw the exact circle of the, mm, uh, like a network reachability area, and if you intersect where the three, three stations inter uh, intersect, this is the uh, location of the user. And when I talk to some radio guys, experts, of course I'm not a radio or even neither he is, and they say that the accuracy with this method will be like a 20 to 50 meters, the way you find the target. target. Uh, so this is about the active attack, the phone attached. Uh, with the GPS, as, as I said, we're not getting a GPS signal, and when we make this GPS attack, like say, asking the sending the GPS coordinates, uh, if there is no GPS signal, the mobile phone will not send any coordinate for that. Uh, and plus, this GPS uh, vulnerability is not available in every phone. So this is a new feature which was added by some vendor, some baseband vendor. Uh, why the reason is because we have a self-organizing networks like a MIMO or self-organizing network and the location is kind of important there. So this is like a new feature. By the standard, this feature is optional. Not everybody support this feature. So there are very few phones which support this, this feature, but unfortunately there might be some internet uh, uh, like uh, uh, M2M modules which also support this feature because with M2M model location is really critical. So you can also have these uh, GPS coordinates from, from that method. But the second is we are running short of time. So DOS attack, what I just give you a brief of, uh, so DOS attack we can't show in practice because you have to force the guy who is attached to T-Mobile. So legally I can't do, we can't do this in the environment. But the, the point with the DOS attack is that as I already said that we can deny all services, like and we can block the user by connecting at all. So of course he can restart the phone and can recover if he notice. The interesting thing is about downgrading the phone to 2G and 3G. And until you restart the phone or take out the SIM card or if you don't notice, your phone will be forever completely on 2G and 3G networks. And if I ask question in the audience, last time when you restart your phone, I, I, I can understand that even the people haven't restarted start their phone last last 10 days or even the five days definitely I mean you you why you restart your phone until you get the problem so this doesn't happen in practice uh, plus there is an in interesting feature which we tried we can block your incoming calls for example you are attached to a 4g networks so we can send the special reject message saying that this guy doesn't support uh, any calls for example he doesn't support voice calls and this message is stored in the network stored will gonna be stored in the network essentially then you will be only allowed data connection if somebody is calling you you're not gonna go you're not gonna get paged to have to say that you got a call something so you will be you you will be blocked by uh, incoming calls and these dos attacks are persistent as we said that because by the standard rule is like a two days but we have seen in the practice that nobody implement the proper counter so phone remains idle even for three days anything and requires to reboot so the, just to give the brief summary, so we have the vulnerabilities in the LTE standard and chipset, which, which allows you to track, and uh, some uh, issues with the social applications, the way it has been the design, uh, the problems with the network deployments of 4G networks, the way we figure out. And then we do a uh, implementation specific attack or even the specification to, to find the location coordinate of the 4G devices, which were not possible before uh, with architecture. The DOS attacks, which we have, which are the persistent and silent to users and also the configurations. I mean, solution I can't say, say anything, but uh, even you can use any phone without battery and SIM card, then you are secure. Uh, let's, let's just give a brief about what has been fixed, what not has been fixed. So we went to public uh, like uh, October 28th. Before that, we informed all the vendors who are affected, even the standardization bodies, that these are the issues. So implementation issues are almost fixed by every baseband vendor, and uh, almost every baseband vendor was also affected with the vulnerability issues because they were and there were different class of attacks, which we also told now, which haven't been fixed, so that's what we didn't tell all of them. Uh, TGP, GSMA, which are the bodies, uh, we also gave them presentation. We, uh, they are working on the fixes. They are, they, have modi they are modifying the standards now to counteract those attacks. Uh, already there are happenings. If you look at the standard documents, you might see now the latest happenings. However, then we talked to the baseband vendors and they said, hey, you fixed those vulnerabilities? They said, yeah, yeah, we fixed it. So, but my phone is still vulnerable. My iPhone is still leaking a data. Then he said, no, it's not our problem. We, we, we patch it, we give it to the OEM, and they haven't have any update. So, so far, all the test phones, we are doing a test from last May. Not a single OEM has been pushed any update on the field. 
So it has been patched by the best band vendor. They said we are fine. You can go public. So we don't. I mean, we don't bother. So so OEM hasn't fixed it yet. This is the problem with uh, our uh, our system. The, uh, our uh, software update systems. Uh, some, unfortunately, there were no response from some baseband vendors. I would like to mention because if, so, if somebody is there, they don't have any contact page, anything, anything. Actually, I had to dig out my personal contacts to find out. Hey, do you know this guy? Are you interested to listen some vulnerability? He said, Yeah, yeah. Let me know. I sent him email and three months no reply, four months no reply. What I what I can do? I can just mention that. So no response from MediaTek, even though they they have a huge uh, handset. Uh, market also with LTE phones. Also, Samsung started their new phone, the Shannon modem. Also, we informed them. So there was little interest from them, their, their side, but no update, their patch or anything. And yesterday, you might have heard that this phone was got pwned actually uh, in a PacSec conference, and the Galaxy S6 modem uh, was vulnerable to to compromise. So mobile network operators, we inform uh, all the tested which we are, but we have seen that there are problems with MME actually, and the MME software has to be patched to configure something. So the, if you are an operator, you might get notice from a GSMA something that there is a problem and you have to fix that. Eventually you will get this information by the sanitation bodies. Uh, and, uh, uh, and already operators are fixing those issues. So that's it from our side, and uh, we still have time five for minutes. questions, I, I believe, so for five minutes. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, in your paper, do you also mention some countermeasures uh, related, related to specification vulnerabilities to be possibly included in the new standards, new ge next generation standards like 5G? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So last week I was in U.S. for the uh, meeting, for the same uh, 3GPP standardization meeting to uh, mention what are the problems. And we also talk about the things which, we, which, we, which may be fixed for the 5G networks. So they, they, consider, they, they consider that they have to take those active attacks like the, the fake base station and they thinking that they, they should be fixing now. With the paper, unfortunately, we don't talk about the long term, but we give some hint that the way we can fix with some agility or uh, with the software-defined networking, there are some ways to fix those those methods in the next generation systems. What about encrypting the ISCI? Encrypting. Yeah, that's a, that, that is like a discussed long time back also. There are many, uh, before they, dis they designed the 4G system, they also considered encrypting MC actually, IMS, MSI. But they thought that effort required to do that or the fallback mechanism to recover in case you were failed to authenticate is not really efficient. And the networks, it's uh, important, is not security for the networks, I mean, I would say, because it's uh, ease for user to be able to connect and make a call. That's important rather than the security. So there has to be really effective, simple backup mechanism so the network will work. So there are other ways to do that. So hopefully in 5G they fix encrypting uh, MC, maybe using a different mechanisms rather than using a, a, a symmetric or asymmetric encryption, which allows you to encrypt, for example. You mean from the baseband side? Yeah. Uh, I mean, with our experience, few baseband vendors replied very quickly. They acknowledged the problem. They patch also, but it took maybe two to three months, barely, because it's not that easy because they have to talk to the different departments whether this is problem or this is, and this takes. So it took somewhere around two to three months to fix uh, to patch those vulnerabilities. But from the OEMs, handset manufacturers, it's not fixed yet. So it's been like almost like a five to six months, no no update yet on the device. So all your 4G devices are affected. This vulnerability is still, but nothing which. And the fixing about the vulnerability issues from the specification side, that will take time. Because this will this has to be modified in the standard. Then there will be action notes from the standardization bodies or GSMA to the handset manufacturers. So everybody has to modi modify. The baseband guys has to modify it. Again, it takes time to patch all the phones. So expect the new phones might have a changes and i don't know whether the old phones will be supported with a new update or not so that that we don't know we have two more, two more minutes any question yeah no 
<laughs> I mean, anybody can just pull out off the shelf and can run. This is not, uh, I mean, we don't feel responsible to just release the source code at all. But the information, the way, because why I said is this information, so if you really want to do further research, you can build on top of that, you can modify it, but you can build your own further and try to test with the phones. But of course, we're not going to give you hands-on code or anything, but we can help you as long as you have some valid reason to build something as a, as a fuzzing platform or something, or to do more research on this platform. So you, you are welcome. You can send us email, and then we can talk about how we can uh, co work together then. And the paper is already public, so if you really want to read the detailed technical information, so we have released the paper already, which will be published in the academic conference uh, NDSS next year. But the paper is already uh, available for, to read. Any more question? Okay, then thanks for your time.